Hello, I'm Joseph Kasser, and today I'm going to talk to you about the top five reasons why you can't write a good requirement, and then what you can do to overcome them. So the topics in this talk are a little bit about me. I don't follow the crowd. I have a history of innovations in systems engineering, project management, and postgraduate continuing education, and I'll just point to some of them in a moment. This means this is not going to be your typical lesson. Then I'm going to tell you the top five reasons and a few more. That's the lesson. And it's an example of how I teach. And as a bonus, I'm going to share with you two innovative tools that you can use after watching this lesson. And then I'll give you a unique, affordable way in which you can learn how to write good requirements and then later on become an outstanding systems engineer or project manager. This is me as I was a few years ago and I've been researching systems engineering, project management and postgraduate education and how to improve them for at least the last 25 years. And when I was in the National University of Singapore, these are some of the books I read as part of my research. Having access to a university library is a tremendous resource. I started off in England as an electronic engineer in the 1960s. I worked my way around the world. I went to the US to help the Americans out with their space program on Apollo 15, 16 and 17. And then I did research into telemetry tracking and control of communication satellites in the US. I moved to Israel and became the department manager and built the control system for the world's first solar energy generating system, commercial that is. We did the R&D in Israel and we installed it in the Mojave Desert outside Los Angeles. After that I went back worked on ground support systems for low earth orbiting satellites. I had small business experience. I founded three small companies. I'm now a consultant, mentor, trainer and educator based in Adelaide, Australia. In terms of academia, I went into academia about 1998. I did my doctorate at George Washington University and did some teaching there. I became a program director at University of Maryland University College and also an adjunct professor. So I was teaching there pretty much full time when I wasn't dealing with students. I moved to Australia in 1999 and became an associate professor and deputy director at the Systems Engineering Evaluation Centre at the University of South Australia. I spent a year as the Lever Hume visiting professor in Cranfield University and seven or eight years at NUS as a visiting associate professor in Singapore. Here's why you need to know what I need to know. This is Jack Ring's unsolicited recommendation. Joseph is outstanding in the field of system design and engineering, not only as a practitioner, but more importantly, as an innovator of ways of educating others about the concepts, methods and benefits of the practice. I'm familiar with the works of more than 40 educators and mentors in this field and can say without equivocation that Joe is in the 3% to make 90% of the difference. Listen to this man. Innovations in systems engineering include, I came up with the idea of systems engineering certification four years before in COSI. I came up with the idea of the in digital integrated environment and published that in 2000. I talked about eliminating text mode requirements in 2002. First example of artificial intelligence in systems engineering tools when I put an expert system into FRED, the first requirements elucidated demonstration, published that in 2004. And I came up with a Hitchens, Casa, Massey framework for understanding systems engineering, which allowed me to explain why there were so many different opinions on what systems engineering is. It evolved into the HKM squared when we added Pascal Mobello a couple of years ago. As far as the innovations in project management, they include the systems approach to planning, 
shows you how to build prevention into a project plan and incorporates risk management and other specialty activities. Improving project status reports within HUT's traffic light charts came in 2016. Improving monitoring of technical performance using CRIP charts in 2015. And they track the state of the requirements from submitted through accepted all the way to completed as time goes by in a software or system development. These give you information you cannot get in the current paradigm. Here's an example of an enhanced traffic light chart for multiple projects. You can see it adds the time dimension and also the expected and actual somewhat like earned value analysis. More information is in the video. And here's an example of the CRIP chart for a category showing requirements creep at PDR. Notice the five states identified in process, completed, in test, and accepted. And you can see that we're in PDR, but we're still identifying and accepting requirements. This chart makes it very clear that that is going on and it cannot be hidden from upper management or anyone else. And moreover, the impact of the additional work should show on the EVA cost and schedule charts. If they don't, there's something wrong in the system. As far as innovations in postgraduate education, they include enhancing online learning with recorded lectures and students presenting knowledge as far back as 1998. Global teaming to enhance learning. Creating useful postgraduate degrees. I've created two postgraduate degrees that earned a lot of money for the institutions in which I was working at the time. In 2008, I started to use magic in the classroom to enhance learning, and I worked on overcoming the defects in the flipped classroom. Flipped classroom doesn't work because the assumptions don't hold. The students don't read the material before they come into class. The balanced classroom makes sure they do. And I also introduced a new lifelong learning model, the Evercourse format, which I use for my classes now. So if you're ready for the lesson, stand by. What I'm going to do is look at the situation from several different perspectives and introduce a couple of tools that I've used to help me deal with these type of problems. So looking at the situation from the big picture perspective, there have been lots and lots of reports about how vital requirements are for project success. For example, over the last 20 years, the project management field has experienced increasing levels of project management processes, tools, governance, compliance, and oversight Yet these activities and products have done nothing to improve project success. And then something I wrote. This paper begins by posing the following question. Why do systems and software engineers continue to produce poor requirements when ways to write good requirements have been documented in conference papers and textbooks? And I wrote that in 2011 and presented it at the Incosi Symposium in Rome. And then poor requirements continue to be cited as major causes of project failures. And here's one article that you can access online if you click on the link from 2016. And not much seems to have changed since then. It's a messy or a wicked problem. And they're advocates for arguing for eliminating written system requirements. There's the agile people and the object-oriented systems engineering people who are advocating eliminating written requirements for various different reasons. So let's formulate the problem using my favorite research tool to help me deal with problems. It's a five-part template. The undesirable situation, the assumptions, the feasible conceptual future desirable situation, the problem, that's what needs to be done to convert the FCS to reality in reverse order. And then the solution, how the undesirable situation will be, in this case, remedied in forward order. So the undesirable situation is the problem has existed for at least 30 years, probably 50, and nobody's been able to do anything about it. So the assumptions, that's my working hypothesis, is even though the information is out there, 
requirements engineers are not being trained or educated properly, that is, to use those tools. So the FCFDS would be, I've identified knowledge that requirements engineers need in order to be able to write good requirements and some of that knowledge, or maybe all of that knowledge, but at least some of that knowledge is not being taught. That will support my hypothesis. In reverse order, going down to the bottom, the first thing I do is gain an understanding of the nature of the problematic, undesirable situation using the holistic thinking perspectives, a tool I'll introduce in a moment. After that, I'll create a reference model for what requirements engineers should be taught. And this is somewhat like Checkland's SSN. And so the solution will be how the undesirable situation will be remedied in forward order. And at the moment, that's unknown. The focus of this talk is gain an understanding of the nature of the problematic undesirable situation using the HTPs so I can give you five things and then we can talk about them. So the holistic thinking perspectives are a way of looking at or perceiving situations, big picture, operational, those external perspectives, functional, structural, those internal perspectives, generic, continuum, and temporal, that are the progressive perspectives. And then there's the quantitative perspective and the scientific perspective, which are the remaining perspectives. The first eight are ways of perceiving the situation, and the ninth one is the output of our thinking process. So if we look at it from the structural perspective, we can find some definitions. Function, an action or activity. A real need, something the stakeholder really needs to remedy a problem. A good requirement is a well-written, feasible to implement, real requirement for which the customer is willing to pay. A requirement engineer, that's a person who elicits and elucidates stakeholder requirements. It's not a job title. That person may be called a systems engineer, a software engineer, a project manager, or whatever. But the role in this particular instance, we're at the front end, so it elicits and elucidates requirements. A textual requirement statement, well, I'm going to share perceptions from the continuum perspective because there are all sorts of definitions. And you'd think that if requirements are key to project success, there would be a standard definition of a text state requirement. Well, there aren't. A stakeholder. People or organizations that are internal or external to the project who have a vested interest in its success or failure. A stakeholder requirement. This is a stakeholder want that has not yet been accepted as a requirement. A well-written requirement is a textual statement that meets the grammatical and vocabulary requirements for well-written textual requirement statements. And I bet you didn't know there were grammatical and vocabulary requirements for well-written text requirements. From the generic perspective, text requirements are just communication tools. There are other ways of communicating stakeholder wants and stakeholder needs. For example, drawings, images, models, schematic, and attributes and properties of objects. And I'm sad that the situation has been around for so long. From the continuum perspectives, there are different classifications of requirements. There are lists of different types of requirements, but little information on how they relate to each other. For example, there are business requirements, functional requirements, non-functional, performance, project, quality, solution, stakeholder, transition requirements, etc. And to make it worse, the IREB defines quality requirements to do exactly the same thing as everybody else defines non-functional requirements to do. And there are various definitions of requirements and types of requirements. And then there are two requirements or systems engineering paradigms. How many of you have heard of that? That was something I presented more than 10 years ago in Rome. Let's look at the various definitions of requirements. From 1990, we have a condition or capability needed by a user to solve a problem or achieve an objective 
or a condition or capability that must be met or possessed by a system or system component to satisfy a contract, standard, specification, or other formally enclosed documents. 3. A documented representation of a condition or capability as in 1 or 2. And then later definitions in INCOSI include something that is wanted or needed, called for or demanded as being essential, 1999. A statement which translates or expresses a need or constraints, technical cost, times, and so on, 2004. Something obligatory or capabilities the system must satisfy, 2006. And how about this one? A requirement statement is the result of a formal transformation of one or more needs or parent requirements into an agreed-to obligation for an entity to perform some function or possess some quality within specified constraints with acceptable risks. Thank you, Inkosi, 2022. Or how about this one? Things to be built or evolved. That's the IREB, their definition in 2022. Nothing about wants or needs. Now let me share with you the A and the B paradigms. The B paradigm starts with collecting requirements, elucidating and elucidating requirements, produces a CONOPS or a model, then creates a system architecture, and then creates the subsystem design and so on. Then there's the A paradigm, which was the original paradigm that started off with developing an understanding of the stakeholders' needs, creating a model that represents the stakeholder needs, verifying that model, then producing the system architecture, of a conceptual system that would meet those needs, then producing the requirements, and then going off into subsystem design. I've shown it as a linear flow for educational purposes, but then in the real world, we don't actually do it linearly. We may go back and forth. So an infeasible requirement in the B paradigm may modify the CONOPS, which would be shown as a confusing feedback loop if we tried to track it. That's why we don't. That's why we teach the waterfall as an educational model, but the real world isn't exactly linear. And the system architecture may change during subsystem design as we run into unforeseen problems. And then just to make it worse, there's a hybrid paradigm that starts with developer, what they call an operations concept document or model that results in the requirements, which then creates another model which produces the system architecture and the subsystem design. And that's why some people want to get rid of requirements, because why create a model, translate it to requirements, and then translate it back into a model? Why not just use the original model? From the operational perspective, we see requirements engineers that are working in scenarios in mostly the B paradigm. And these activities include eliciting and elucidating requirements, converting stakeholder wants to real needs, writing requirements, but there's a fundamental flaw in that, which nobody seems to realize because they don't step back and look at big picture. There is no reference to know that the observed set of activities is complete and correct. Just because you see them doing something doesn't mean what they're doing is correct, and you don't know if there's something out there they should be doing. And perhaps our education and training is not teaching everything they need to know to do what they should be doing. From a functional perspective, they're doing cognitive activities that requirements engineers in general may do in the operational scenarios, and I use the word may because they don't always do it. Thinking or systems thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, communicating with stakeholders, making assumptions, and hopefully validating those assumptions. From the temporal perspective, we see the evolution from paper requirement documents to computer databases and simple tools. We see the evolution of models from calculators to computers with increasing capability. And then the digital integrated environment, which proposed expanding the traditional requirements traceability matrix into a Blackboard-style database in 2000. 
And that was the first mention of what is now called digital thread and other things. Back in 2003, there were prototype tools that could detect some types of poorly written requirements. They included NASA's Automated Requirements Measurement, the Quality Gateway, published in 1997 and 1999, the Precept Counselor, and then FRET, the First Requirements Elucidator Demonstration Tool, which was published in the INCOSI Journal on Systems Engineering in 2004, which evolved into Tiger Pro, which is an educational tool for telling you whether you've got some types of poor requirements. And I claim it's the first practical use of AI in the form of an expert system in systems engineering. From the scientific perspective, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. This is often misattributed to Albert Einstein. Check that out and you'll find out for yourself. So I have a hypothesis. There's something missing or wrong in the education and training of requirements engineering. So I have a new problem. How do I identify what's missing or wrong to support the hypothesis? Hmm. So my innovative out of the box methodology number one to create that FCFDS is use workflow analysis to create a linear educational conceptual representation of what should be done. And I'll call that a reference model. It's linear because we know it's not going to be linear in the real world, but at least we can break it up into manageable parts and understand it and teach it. And then compare what's being done in the real world with a reference model. If differences and gaps are identified, then the hypothesis will be supported. So if we look at workflow analysis for writing good requirements, we start with stakeholders asking for something they want. That should be converted to stakeholders' real needs. And that gets converted to system-specific poorly written requirements, which get converted to well-written requirements, which get converted to good requirements. Or maybe somebody can really write well-written and good requirements up front, but let's assume they can't and see what needs to be done to do the conversions. And then there are times when stakeholders ask for things they don't need. Those have to be weeded out. And there are things the stakeholders need, but they don't ask for because they don't know they need it for whatever reason. And so we have to have a systemic and systematic methodology for identifying stakeholders. And if you do the research, you find there isn't or there wasn't one until I started doing the research. And then there are generic needs for types of the specific system which can be used in several ways. They can be used to give you a reference model that you can start tailoring to meet the stakeholder's specific need. And they can be used to find those generic requirements that apply to the, to the system. They may be legal, safety, security, and so on. And if we do the gap analysis, it turns out like this. We teach people reasonably well to speak to stakeholders and get their wants. There are lots of tools and techniques out there. We let people write poorly written requirements. The blocks in yellow are not taught very well. The block in orange may be taught, but the blocks in red are hardly ever taught. Now, my research is a little dated, so there may be courses out there that do teach some of those things. But based on that research, the reason why you can't write a good requirement is it's not your fault. You haven't been told how to identify the stakeholders systemically and systematically. All the literature contains the word includes or including, so you never get a complete set. You haven't been taught how to elicit and elucidate stakeholder requirement requests properly. You haven't been taught how to convert stakeholder requirement requests into real stakeholder requirements. You haven't been taught how to write a well-written requirement. And you haven't been taught how to maximize the probability of having a complete set of baseline requirements. Were you taught that there were two kinds of requirements at the start of a project? There were the baseline requirements that should be articulated at the time. And then we know that the need is going to change during the system development process. 
and during the operations and maintenance phase. So you can't get those requirements up front. But the mantra has been get the requirements up front. Well, wait a minute, you can only get the baseline requirements up front. And how do you get a complete set? You haven't been taught that. And there's even more. And here from my research are some other examples of what you haven't been taught. You haven't been taught the difference between system generic and system specific requirements. You haven't been taught that one development methodology does not fit all development projects. For example, there's a difference between the development methodology for bespoke systems that most systems engineers focus on and mass market systems or products that a lot of software engineers focus on. You haven't been taught the three domains. The three domains of systems engineering or software engineering in terms of requirements uh, you need to understand the problem domain, the solution domain, and the implementation domain. The three situations or representations. The as-is situation that's undesirable. The conceptual future desirable situation. And the transition situation. You haven't been taught the three reasons for requirement changes. Those that are forgotten or not articulated, that is baseline needs before SRR, evolution of needs during the development and operations. Those changes are going to happen. You need to be aware of them and allow them to be included. And then requirements change because everybody understands the baseline needs better during development operations and customer and the stakeholders may find that there's something in there they don't need or there's something in there they do need that they hadn't realized. And then how these different types of requirements relate. You learn about different types of requirements, system requirements, software requirements, communication requirements, mission requirements, stakeholder requirements, and so on and so on and so on. But I haven't seen any drawings that show how they relate. So now you know what you need to know and why you need to know it. So where can you gain this knowledge? First, you can become a member of a unique, innovative program. Personal membership is affordable in any country. It's the monetary equivalent of 42 cups of coffee at your local cafe per month. So wherever you are, you can afford it. Nobody else can offer such a course at such a price. It's designed for professionals who cannot commit to a weekly schedule or take the time for a three to five day course. You must have at least two years work experience and have taken at least one postgraduate or professional development course so you can resonate and understand the concepts that are being discussed in the class. It uses the EverCourse format combining synchronous and asynchronous learning activities. It's optimized for learning by absorption, listening, reading, doing, teaching, and sharing experiences. You cannot get this in any other regular learning experience. However, it necessitates keeping the class size small. Members of the program watch the video lectures in their own time. Do the exercises in their own time. They take part in the scheduled live weekly sessions to present the exercises, comment on other members' exercises, and discuss work-related issues. Even if they haven't done an exercise that week, there is no requirement to do an exercise a week. Personal life professional activities all interfere with learning. Participants attend to learn by listening, watching, and discussing and absorbing, even if they're not doing an exercise presentation that week. They can view the recorded live sessions, which started in December 2020. The class has been running for three years. It went through a prototype. It's evolved into its current format. And as a bonus, members of the program get access to three other programs at no extra cost. 
creating outstanding problem solvers, creating outstanding systems engineers, and creating outstanding project managers. However, I strongly recommend that members do one course at a time. Is this for you? Think about it. And I acknowledge comments by and contributions from Bruce Lerner and Niels Malato in the creation of the lesson. Are you ready? Are you ready to talk to me about your interest? Click on the link below to learn more about the program and talk to me about your interest and whether this program is for you. It's not for everybody. If it's not for you, fine. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and can make use of what you've been taught. If it is for you, I look forward to talking to you and having you in the program. Take care.